So I'd like to welcome everybody to the first workshop of the Hassanda consultation series. My name is Kristen Kang. I'm a senior research data specialist at ARDC and I'm the program manager for Hassanda. So today we'll be giving you an overview of the initiative and discussing the research purpose of the data asset. To begin with, we acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and we pay our respects to the elders past and present. So in today's workshop, we'll go for 90 minutes uh, and be split up into three sections. Uh, we'll begin with an overview of the initiative by Dr. Adrian Burton, ARDC's Director of Data Policy and Services. And we'll then have a presentation on the value of data sharing, specifically sharing uh, clinical trials data presented by professors Lisa Askey and Julian Elliott. This will be followed by a Q&A session uh, where you can put your questions to the presenters. And after that, we'll be moving into breakout sessions where, we, uh, where we'll be discussing uh, the research uses and needs for data sharing and the potential value of a national data asset and what it could provide for you. So how do you provide feedback? During the workshop, as I said, there's going to be a Q&A and you can submit questions uh, via the chat channel. And then in the breakout sessions, we'll be asking you to provide your user stories <coughs> and value propositions. And you all should have received the uh, workshop reference document prior to attending and there was information about uh, preparing some responses for those breakout sessions. After the workshop, we'll email you all a link um, to an to a online uh, survey system, as it were, uh, but via that survey system, you can provide your own written submission in your own words. Uh, and there's also a structured feedback questionnaire, um, which will probe into some focus questions. Uh, and you'll have basically to the end of next week to complete that. As I said, in the breakout sessions, we'll be focusing on two questions. How would you use a national data asset? and what kind of value would a national data asset provide you? For those of you who haven't already uh, provided your breakout room preferences, uh, you can go to that URL, so tiny.cc slash hassanda hyphen A. I'll be posting that in chat shortly, uh, and you can put your name down against the topic that you would like to discuss. That's all for me for now. Uh, so we'll begin with the presentations. And I'll hand over to Adrian Burden uh, to present an overview of the Hassanda Initiative. All right, can you all see that? That was a yes, I'm assuming. Uh, yes, I can see it. I'm uh, Adrian Burton. I work at the Australian Research Data Commons. It's uh, a national infrastructure facility and we deal with things like data collections, data access and analytics platforms, storage, cloud, uh, skills, policy, everything at a very holistic view of the national requirements uh, for data infrastructure. We're part, it's part of the NCRIS uh, program, it's the National Research Infrastructure Strategy. It's a strategy that comes from the Department of Education to support nationally significant uh, data assets and services that support leading edge research. The funding comes directly from the Commonwealth Government and it's meant to fund some national level initiatives that are beyond local or institutional um, capability. Today we're talking about a health studies uh, data asset um, that's part of a big jigsaw puzzle of, of uh, data that's related and overlapping. Um, in this initiative, we're focusing in on that middle part, the health studies. It's not meant to be complementary types here, or, uh, but just to give us an idea of what the, the focus of this initiative it is. In 2019, we did some public consultation with the CSIRO on research health studies data requirements. And this very complex set of data 
possibilities and inputs and outputs of research and outputs of administration um, all came up. The, we were encouraged to look at the, this part in the middle. On the left, you can see it's stuff coming from the health system and on the right, there's other types of uh, sort of inputs to research projects. Um, the, the, what came out of the consultation was that there is, at least there are custodians of these big health system data sets it's, it's, uh, and there are parts of the national infrastructure like the PHRN that give access uh, to, for, uh, to these kind of data sets for linkage purposes, for example. Over at Genomics Data, we have a, a national research infrastructure cap uh, capability by Platforms Australia. In imaging, there's several national capabilities in um, uh, the National Imaging Facility, uh, Microscopy Australia. But that uh, in this middle part, uh, for the actual outputs of research projects of health studies projects there was not really a, a national level um, capability of you know custodians and standards and national infrastructure of course all this data is important and and actually the the value is from connecting all this stuff up but uh, this initiative the Hassan initiative is looking at the re requirements of that middle area when we say health studies, just to give you an example there, we're talking clinical trials, registries, cohorts, and uh, other kinds of health study. And we're talking about the outputs of those, um, those research projects, the data outputs. So our consultation came up with a number of uh, conclusions. One, the, the, the first one was that actually you can and, and should create a, a, a national data asset from the outputs of these research projects because they can support leading edge research and the kinds of things that were um, suggested were uh, meta-analysis guidelines, uh, other linkage and scaled up research more generally. Uh, we were advised to start with a distributed model because there's a lot of fragmentation of health systems and jurisdictions and um, there wasn't an existing sort of national uh, infrastructure cap capability in this area. And uh, the NHMRC were very keen for us to work in tandem with their new program of uh, clinical trials and cohort studies. So. What came out of that was this initiative. It's called the Health Studies Australian National Data Asset. It's a program, a three-year program that we're, we're launching. We call it Hassanda for short. Uh, it's meant to be a significant first step in this area. It's not meant to, we're not starting where we want to finish with a unified uh, national service. Uh, we're starting with a distributed national data asset. And on the right, you can see there, this is a very common, um, uh, sort of model in at least in information systems. This one is from um, drone flight management you know, of having a, a set of services and capabilities that uh, are federated or aggregated together um, and you can uh, divide up the problem and uh, but still have some kind of uh, central view of it. Uh, in order to do that, you need a lot of community uh, coordination and coherence, and this project is really investing uh, in, the, in that kind of activity, and today is the first sort of example of that. The key thing we're doing here is flagging our strategic intent that this data is important, and it can and does uh, support uh, really very important research programs, but that we're not set up for, we haven't really set that up as an infrastructure um, concern. So the strategic intent is to stop treating data as a sort of waste product of the research industry that creates journal publications. Uh, it's, and to try and think about what, how to capture some value from this, uh, the, this output of the, the research process. Now, of course, we're doing this now, but it's rather cottage industry with uh, emails to people and social networks allowing access to some bits and pieces, but not really on a, any kind of organized level. And I think that's the, 
the idea of the Sanda project is to get us all together and in, in, in with a strategic intent and to build towards a more industrial model and you know to take the first steps there. The uh, initiative is resourced by the ARDC with some of those Commonwealth funds which are meant to catalyze these kinds of uh, national data assets. And uh, we have a program advisory committee. I just did this uh, slide and I'm just hoping I didn't forget anyone. I did it a minute before we, we came here. We have including, I'll say, uh, the National Health and Medical Research Council, uh, the Australian Clinical Trials Association, uh, the Australian Health Research Alliance, Australian New Zealand Clinical Trials Registry, Research Australia, Population Health Research Network, and Julian's right there, and I forgot to write Cochrane Australia uh, as well. I knew I was forgetting somebody. But that's a, it's a meant to be a community initiative, and we are taking guidance from uh, the big national uh, bodies in this area. Uh, we've made a few sort of uh, pragmatic decisions around focus. Uh, the, the full initiative is what we've said. It's around health studies and you know everything. But in the first instance, we're lining up to get at least coverage of the, uh, the studies that are funded by the NHMRC. Uh, we're focusing in, in on the research organizations of universities and medical research institutes. The first focus area, we're looking at clinical trials. And we may well add uh, some focus areas uh, uh, to do with uh, subject area or, or disease. The, uh, as there are three strands to the Hassanda initiative, uh, we're dealing with data and getting coherence around data. We're building a coordinated set of infrastructure um, across the nation and uh, we are looking at the culture, the, the required culture of what the researchers need, what the patients need, what, a, what is a coherent policy environment for this. Your, uh, those three strands are set out in a project plan like this. We are in the middle of the, the today you are at a, a data development consultation workshop, so we are right in the middle of that first phase there. Uh, this data development phase is meant to, you know, get an initial scope and, and consensus around what, it, uh, what the data asset uh, will be. Um, it's a stepwise process. Um, we starting today's workshop is around the purpose of the uh, national data asset. There'll be a second uh, workshop which focuses on the content of the data asset. We'll look at any shared practices and standards in a third workshop and in our fourth we'll look at some of the threshold issues around governance and access, not really data problems, and it's not really a data development concern, but there are important um, concerns around uh, access arrangements, consent, IT, etc. This process is uh, informed by the AIHW. We've been lucky to be able to have a partnership with the AIHW, and this they go through this process of creating national data assets all the time and we are this process is informed by an uh, by a sort of formal process that the AIHW have and we have uh, Roxanne Foster and Vicky Bennett who are working with us on that. So that's uh, all I wanted to say except that the output of today's um, uh, of this, not today, of the four workshops will be an initial consensus document um, on the data asset and its scope. And we really can uh, encourage you to contribute and um, answer this, the, the structured survey forms that will come out after uh, uh, around each of these topics and participate in the workshops. Uh, it's very important. This uh, we will take these questions to much wider stakeholder consultations. When we've got the shape of what we're doing, we'll take that to patient groups and researchers and institutions to say, you know, uh, you know what, uh, how should we do this? But the, it's this initial consensus that we'll be taking to that to, to wider consultation. It will also be the input into our infrastructure development program, which will start at the end of the year. We will be providing co-investment into the development of infrastructure and it will be 
the requirements of that infrastructure will be the uh, outputs of this started development phase that you're working on. And uh, we talked about standards and common standards and practices. We probably in the, this is the first phase is just a two or three month phase. Uh, we thoroughly intend to come back to that because uh, data standards is, is a long process and we will look at that uh, during uh, 2021, a, a second go at the, the standards then. So I'll stop there and uh, hand on to, so the, the objective of today was to get an overview of the initiative and to start to answer that for that first data development question is, what is the purpose of uh, this kind of a national data asset? So our next two speakers will talk on that second topic. Um, yeah, so thanks to Adrian and Kristen for in inviting uh, me to talk today. I'm going to set a bit of a broader scene and then Lisa will go into some of the more detail around um, individual participant data meta-analysis. Um, so first of all, just to disclose my um, interests. So I um, have a number of roles at Cochrane, including leading evidence systems and the Living Evidence Network. Uh, I'm based at Monash University at Cochrane Australia, uh, where I lead the um, the National COVID-19 clinical, clinical Evidence Task Force, which is developing national guidelines for COVID-19. Uh, and, um, and then a longer term initiative, the Australian Living Evidence Consortium. Um, I'm also co-founder and CEO of Covidence, which is a non-profit platform for systematic review. And I, um, I'm a clinician working in infectious diseases at the Alfred. Uh, so I think all of us, I imagine, are aware of um, the many challenges to sharing uh, health research data. But to start, I just wanted to emphasize what I saw as some of the main um, uh, value of sharing individual participant data. So first of all, um, that enables new discovery. Um, so Lisa will go into this in a bit more detail, but it's certainly true that by enabling others to have access to data, new research questions um, can be pursued. Um, um, beyond what the original um, trialist may have been able to do, uh, and also certainly far beyond what might be possible with only summary data. Also in the, in the spirit of reproducibility and transparency, um, it enables further validation of findings by making it possible for others to reanalyze and review um, prior results. Uh, it, through, that, through those mechanisms can certainly help to prevent unnecessary repetition of trials and the waste and the risk to additional patients um, because of the additional um, findings that can be generated through participant level um, analyses. Um, and, and sort of linked to that is the ability to improve the design of future trials because of um, better insights from the, the trial data that has been accrued so far. And I think perhaps most importantly, it really maximizes the contribution that a research data set can make. And so therefore really honors and maximizes the contribution that participants have made um, through their participation in that particular health study. I think it's also important to note that uh, clinical trial, trial data sharing hasn't just appeared out of nowhere. It really is the next step in, a, in quite a long history of increasing transparency around um, health research um, over time. It really started with the whole concept of randomized clinical trials. Uh, then the development of clinical trial registration, uh, which Lisa will mention, uh, which has of course been critical in um, developing a, a stronger um, culture and practice of transparency. Uh, then the um, expectation of clinical trial summary results reporting um, in a systematic and um, uh, consistent way. Uh, and then building upon that, now the rise of individual participant data sharing. Just to position this in the, in the broader context, um, this is a schema of um, how we see the um, development and use of knowledge within health systems. So at nine o'clock, you can see all of the activities around producing evidence or generating data. Uh, where we as Cochrane sit is in this step around synthesizing um, all of that primary research data. At the moment, of course, that's largely summary data in the form of journal publications. 
um, largely, but not exclusively, because of the rise of individual participant data analyses. Um, we, of course, then spent a lot of time producing um, rigorous and usable reports that can be then used to develop guidelines and other products and services that disseminate, disseminate that evidence to clinicians. And then in addition, um, mechanisms to disseminate the evidence to patients such as decision aids and shared decision making. Um, subsequent to that, of course, there's a lot of um, people working on the implementation on knowledge translation, evaluation and improving practice. I think what's um, very true currently is that this ecosystem uh, at the moment is largely driven um, by documents rather than data and is characterized by years often between each step, um, which I would argue is just no longer tenable. It's, an, it's a complete travesty that we are still in a world um, that is characterized by such delays um, and inefficiencies. So what we see developing over the next few years is what we call a living evidence ecosystem where each of these steps is accelerated generated by the development of these kind of core principles and, and pillars. Um, and as you can see at the core of this, we really see digitally structured data. Um, so in the first instance, that of course can be better structuring of summary data, but increasingly um, we see that that will be individual participant data. And of course ar around that, there are many other aspects that are required in order to leverage that, including a culture of sharing tools and platforms, common understanding of methods, etc. Also to note that, of course, we are in an era um, in which learning health systems are becoming um, more prominent and uh, a reality. Uh, so this is a, a concept originally developed by Chuck Friedman and others, um, but I think now has really got a, a lot of momentum which is really about the way health systems can better use the own data that they are generating within these um, internal cycles within a particular health system. So data to knowledge, knowledge to performance, performance to data. Um, in this paper, Chuck, um, together with some um, Cochrane colleagues of ours, really clarified that there is a necessary step in which a given health system is also incorporating critically appraised external evidence. Again, at the moment, that's largely summary data um, in the form of conventional systematic reviews, but increasingly that will be um, synthesized evidence based on individual participant data. And certainly when you um, start to explore the real opportunities in, uh, let's say, precision medicine, uh, a lot of that really is driven by access to individual data that can enable um, understandings for perhaps not individuals initially, but certainly smaller and smaller subgroups. So I, I would argue that um, increasing use of IPD is an essential step in the efficient, um, uh, con uh, efficient um, conjunction of uh, synthesized research evidence and, and individual health systems using um, their own data in a learning health system model. So I think later in um, this afternoon, we're, we're gonna be asked to think around um, user stories around, uh, um, around the use of these data. So I'll just give you a summary of how I see um, the, a, a potential national health study data asset um, being of value um, to systematic reviewers. So first of all, uh, as a systematic reviewer, I want unique identifiers and accurate structured metadata for each data set so that I can find the data I need quickly and easily. This is absolutely critical. I'll talk about this in a minute. Um, of course, I want consistent data across studies so that I can combine the data so that it's, it's uh, reasonable and appropriate um, to combine those data from different studies. I want the ability to understand the data so that whether it's myself or in a collaborative group can make valid and efficient decisions about the way that we should be working with these data and how we should or should not be combining. Now that may be in the form of a, um, 
uh, data dictionary, but also importantly, through the ability to have conversations with the original um, trialists. Of course, I also want ethical approval for pulling in analyses that are not delayed by the need for additional approvals. Uh, and in some form, I want access to secure and flexible analytical space so that I can aggregate as many data sets as possible and use the best analytical approach and tools. So that's just a very brief overview, I think, of the way that systematic reviewers would look at a, a national data asset of this form. Just want to touch on a couple of points. First of all, of course, it's not just about the IPD itself. Um, it's also about the protocol, the study protocol, uh, data dictionary, the statistical analysis plan, um, clinical study report, if that is available, and then finally the IPD. Um, so when thinking around this asset, we have to think about not only access to the IPD data set itself, but also all the, all the other assets associated with that that really enhance um, the data set's value. Now, just I wanted to take a couple of minutes just to talk about metadata. <laughs> this is critical to our world. Um, first of all, any metadata associated with any research asset, um, whether that be a journal publication or an IPD data set, must be accurate. Um, I think it's a fair summary to say that um, the majority of the time spent in systematic reviews is largely because of poor metadata. Um, if we had much richer and more accurate metadata, it would dramatically um, accelerate the process of systematic review uh, and uh, um, make the process of systematic review a, a much more feasible, efficient and cost-effective um, process. So that I think is critical to keep in mind. Um, must be flexible to different types of data. Um, so as I mentioned just before, there are, there are different assets that are of uh, importance when thinking about systematic review. So we need metadata that is flexible to those different um, elements, but also in some ways future-proofed to other types of um, assets that may become available in the future. Uh, curation is critical. So obviously linked back to the first point, um, whatever system we establish for the curation of the metadata that is associated with this asset is uh, going to be a critical point in the decision making. Um, and again, Lisa and others will talk, um, could talk uh, for quite some time about the challenges of, of metadata curation in the context of clinical trial registries. Um, and certainly we, we see the challenges downstream in systematic review. So the appropriate role of the data owner or submitter um, and of the QA process around that um, is uh, essential to get right. And please, please, can we think about structured and computable metadata? I think in 2020, it's really uh, not tenable to be thinking about uh, just uh, user-generated natural language. Uh, we do need metadata systems that are much more structured and computable. So in the end, this is really all consistent with the FAIR data principles, which I imagine is familiar um, to most of you. Um, and in the end, the principle being that when data are more discoverable and more usable, they will enable more analysis and therefore more um, value to be generated from that asset. So just very quickly um, to note that we, at Cochrane, we've been spending a lot of time on metadata systems and increasingly we use um, very broad data assets um, rather than um, the individual bespoke approaches that perhaps have been the characteristic of systematic review for some time. So just to note that we, we're using uh, machine learning, um, crowdsourcing, and a particular approach to structured data called linked data um, to enhance the metadata that um, is available, characterizing study design, topics, PICO, um, and then finally, um, the type of data contained. Sitting under this is a lot of work around um, an ontology. So this is Cochrane's PICO ontology that characterizes the the structure of the knowledge relevant um, to health systematic reviews. That's linked to a number of um, controlled vocabularies. Many of these I think will be familiar to you. So SNOMED CT, MEDRA, ATC, RxNorm, and many others. And we've built an infrastructure that enables us to um, um, curate metadata of all of those um, research assets that are within um, the Cochrane uh, sphere. Uh, which then enables much better um, discoverability of those assets. So here's just a, 
an example of a um, of how we can use that structured data to filter by population intervention, etc. We've been using this now um, for a few years within Cochrane it's, itself, um, curating our data assets, but now also increasingly using this um, in partnership with other groups. And just to mention that this is um, uh, uh, now being used by Vivli, which is a um, clinical trial data sharing platform established in the US, a nonprofit, uh, which is taking a federated approach. Um, so, you know, it's a relevant example, I think, for us thinking about our approach in Australia. Um, and that um, metadata system is enabling more precise um, discoverability of their data assets. Uh, and then just to finish to say that, um, to give an example, um, we, we are now um, developing and maintaining national living guidelines for COVID-19 uh, using all the systems that I've just described. And through that, we're able to have rigorous evidence-based clinical guidelines that are updated every week. That's a pace that has not been achieved previously. That of course is sitting upon largely summary data from journal publications. But I think through the development of assets such as this, you know, we're hopeful that in the near future, we will also be able to draw on individual participant data. Um, and Lisa will describe in a bit more detail the, um, the additional value of those data sets. Thank you. Um, uh, and thanks um, for the invitation. Um, just to also disclose my um, my affiliations. I um, work at the Clinical Trial Centre at the University of Sydney, um, a, a part of Cochrane in the role of a, a co convener of the Cochrane Perspective Meta Analysis Methods Group and the, a manage, and the manager of the Australian New Zealand Clinical Trials Registry. And from September, I'll be at the World Health Organisation in Geneva. Um, but uh, just to point out that um, uh, the views I expressed today are. Um, my own and not necessarily reflective of any of those organisations. Um, sorry, why are we, can we not progress? There we are. Um, uh, so, um, as Julian pointed out, um, clinical trials registries uh, already do actually uh, enable and, per uh, and permit and, and allow storage of quite a lot of information about trial registries um, that step through progress uh, that Julian talked about. So we do, uh, from a trial registration record, before the first patient's enrolled, know a lot about uh, the, the, the methods of a trial. Uh, records can be updated during the course of a trial to add more information about approval sites and numbers of patients recruited, etc. We can already, uh, certainly in the Australian New Zealand Clinical Trials Registry, actually lodge many of the documents um, uh, Julian talked about, the protocol, the analysis plan, data dictionaries, et cetera. Um, it'd be fair to say they're not particularly well curated or uh, findable, but they do can exist and do exist. And we uh, also permit the uploading of summary results from the uh, completed clinical trials and baseline characteristics, mm -hmm. either in a structured format, such as clinicaltrials.gov has a very structured system where you have to enter data in a particular way, or all the other registries that exist have uh, essentially an unstructured format, which is um, a, a PDF essentially, where you can you can do summary, uh, lodge summary information. But none of the uh, registries currently or permit the lodgement of raw line by line de-identified individual participant data. And as Julian's outlined, this is where we think there's a major value add for this project. It's also should be noted that it's it's not just, again, we, we, we haven't just sort of um, dreamed this up. Um, since 2018, um, any person conducting a clinical trial and wanting and wishing to report it in the major journal, uh, medical journals, that are governed by the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors must submit a, a plan uh, when they, uh, a statement when they submit their 
manuscript. And that um, statement often asks you, you know, what, how, where, and and when, and and the mechanism for actually sharing data. And many, particularly uh, investigator initiated. Uh, trialists often haven't had a place where they can actually uh, lodge uh, their 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 um, completed and uh, finalised individual patient data uh, set. So, um, just to make sure people are clear what I'm talking about in terms of individual patient data, it's different from aggregate data. When you do an aggregate data systematic review or meta analysis, you go find the papers, uh, then you try and extract information from the papers. Now we've got some more sophisticated systems, as Julian pointed out, machine reading, etc. But essentially we're extracting it from, pa from papers or publications. Un conversely, individual participant data involves people. You actually gather the people. Uh, here's one we prepared er earlier some time ago um, from many um, trialists around the world. Um, and you gather those people together and extract uh, the data from those people. So what we're talking about is actually line by line data, line by line, row by row for each patient and column by column for um, particular data points, variables, um, characteristics, outcomes. You often in an IPD ask people to provide it to you with a particular format and, uh, and with particular uh, select variables, what usually happens is you get something like this. Um, now, you can imagine if people, you know, it's a data asset, but is it actually all that usable? And uh, the short answer, is, as Julian has emphasised as well, is no, without um, proper metadata and uh, curation of that data and all the other supporting data that, that uh, goes with the actual data set. So if it is accompanied by the relevant metadata, what sort of um, things can we do with IPD that uh, we couldn't otherwise do if we didn't have that line by line data? Um, one of the most important things we can do is look at different treatment effects in particular subgroups. And I give this simple example, but it's a, it's one in my world. I come from the perinatal trials world. and it's, it, it, it's a problem when people um, uh, uh, publish their data with particular uh, different cut points when you're looking at a, at a particular outcome. So uh, the, um, the outcome of very preterm birth means different things to different people in different parts of the world. So in somewhere like Malawi, a baby born less than 34 weeks is, is, is a real disaster. Most don't actually survive. Uh, for people, say, in Venezuela, that cut point is um, more relevant uh, at a different gestation. And for us here in Australia, uh, you know, the cut point is different yet again because we have a different healthcare service and we really want to see different um, and we make a lot of different treatment decisions, whether a baby's very small, very early um, versus greater than 34 weeks. So each trial would have reported those things quite differently and quite legitimately for the for the, the setting in which that trial was done. But um, what we can't do is then combine those data very easily um, when, when that's in a publication. Whereas we know that for every um, baby in every trial, uh, the trialists will have recorded the gestation, the actual gestational age for each baby. So with the access to the actual line by line data, we can use a cut point that's consistent across all the trials. And these subgroups uh, and putting the data together are very often the focus of future trials. Um, and, and it's one of the reasons why NHMRC highly recommends now a, a systematic review of data before you, uh, as justification for your trial, because you want to see um, in a, if there are particular subgroups of patients where the treatment effect might be, um, what the direction and magnitude is. We can also use IPD to look at different outcomes that, that were, that, then that was, that was the focus of the original trial. Example here is from, uh, again, the, 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 the group I showed before, where we looked at aspirin to prevent preeclampsia. Um, but um, we, um, uh, some years later, there was much more of a focus uh, and an interest in, in the effect of aspirin on spontaneous preterm birth. 
Um, and yet, rather than uh, go, go off and do another whole series of trials, we could use the data from more than 30,000 women and, and, and babies to reanalyze because we had the information about whether a, a birth had been a spontaneous preterm birth or an iatrogenic one, uh, and could make an assessment about the effect of antiplatelets on um, spontaneous preterm birth. Uh, without having to do necessarily um, a whole a whole lot of new trials. Um, what else can it do? It's uh, sadly um, uh, we are realizing that that fraudulent data is is now becoming a problem. Um, Jennifer Byrne, uh, a couple of years ago, my colleague at Sydney Uni was uh, listed in Nature's top ten of people who mattered in the world. Uh, that year, in terms of um, using some software to detect, um, systematic uh, errors and uh, sometimes fraud in uh, genomics data. We've done some work uh, recently with uh, Ben Moll and others at Monash and, and in the Netherlands, uh, looking at ways of um, assessing data from clinical trials to see whether they were uh, actually um, uh, unlikely to be, to be real. Uh, this was uh, published in the European Journal. Uh, th this is about information that went into um, into uh, uh, from trials that we uh, have been used in European and, and US guidelines. Um, interestingly, someone posted on ResearchGate confirming what we'd found that the, in fact the data from thousands of patients were actually um, not uh, real. And we concluded in that trial that really without a, a peer reviewer working in isolation, without access to underlying IPD is, is very unlikely to be able to detect the patterns that we could detect um, when we've got IPD available from not only individual trials, but a series of trials. And finally, uh, one other thing that IPD can do and add value to is really being able to better investigate the interplay between participant level characteristics and intervention level characteristics and thus being able to better tailor or implement um, these effective effective interventions either at scale for particular uh, communities or or socio-demographic uh, groupings or at um, an actual personalized uh, medicine level which again i think uh, Julian referred to. We've been trying to do some initial work on that, looking at childhood obesity prevention, deconstructing interventions, and then being able to match that um, against uh, participant level uh, characteristics uh, in a way that is going to make it um, more possible to scale up these interventions in a more, but in a more targeted uh, way. Um, I'll just finish by saying um, that we think uh, we, we know that most of the time we're doing trials that are too individually, they're too small, which is why we do meta-analysis. Here's the, uh, the, the median sample size from the initial batch of COVID, COVID trials, all with median sample size in the hundreds and what, you're, what you really need is in the thousands, if you're gonna detect the sort of differences we're expecting. If we put them all together, we'd, uh, we'd, we would have thousands. Um, some people have been talking about this for some time, basically saying mate, every, all data should be openly available to everyone. This is the all trials group. Uh, this has been Goldacre. There's usually a lot of television cameras around him, as you can see there. Um, and, but on the other hand, there is potential, I think, disadvantages for a completely open system the potential for data dredging, misuse of the data, privacy concerns. So what we're really talking about here and what uh, Hassander is proposing is a, is a moderated access to a recognized data repository that can potentially overcome many of those problems. Um, but it does need to be uh, something that is, uh, has fair principles, that it's safe, has good governance and, and well resourced, which is what um, the group is going to work towards. And as I've said, it needs to, and does have close links with trial registries and data sharing. So I think um, both uh, Julia's presentation uh, and hopefully what I've presented to you shows how we need big, we do need big data and in this era we need fast data, but that data needs to be reliable and true and we, we still do have some bumps and bridges ahead of us, but I think this uh, uh, national clinical trials data asset will really be a major step forward in our ability uh, to improve transparency and data access, but reduced 
for research waste. Okay, I think I'll finish there, Kristen. Um, I'll stop sharing my screen. Thanks very much. We'll hand over to Roxanne now. Thanks, Kristen. Can you hear me? Yep, perfectly. Beautiful. Uh, I'm Roxanne from the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare Metadata and Meteor Unit. I'll be moderating today's Q&A session and presenting questions to the panel members, Adrian, Lisa and Julian. We'll start with some questions that came out of the pre-workshop survey. I'll just bring up the screen. Okay, so the first question is for Lisa. How does Hassanda align with clinical trials registries and other clinical trials management activities? Does it overlap or enhance? Well, hopefully I pointed out that it enhances. So um, there isn't, as I said, there isn't an ability to lodge individual patient data on any of the trial registries. So there is some ability to, um, to lodge some of the metadata, but um, uh, it could be better curated and I think a, a system where you, you can follow a trial all the way through um, from registration all the way through to actually getting um, the individual data in an in a organised system would be, would be definitely an, an enhancement. Thanks Lisa. Um, I'm just going to um, put a reminder here as well if, if people could please complete their breakout room preference while I'm um, posing questions to the panel members that would be great so that we can assign you to the appropriate room. So the next question is for Adrian. How can Hassanda accommodate data governance issues and roles? For example, data custodianship instead of ownership. Good. Uh, happy to give a short answer now. Um, if we don't get to all these questions in the in the allocated time, uh, we will answer all these questions in a, and get a frequently asked question kind of register up there. Um, yes, data governance and uh, access, um, custodianship, ownership are all very, very important um, issues. We, in fact, have dedicated a, uh, the fourth uh, workshop, the Theme D workshop, to exactly these kind of issues. Um, and so potentially today I'll just pause there and say yes we agree that this is a, a very important issue and uh, it's part of the, the initial consultation. Thanks Adrian. There's a couple more questions here for you. How will Hassanda deal with existing data sharing and interoperability standards, technology platforms and repositories? Will Hassanda implement its own standards? Again, uh, we uh, agree that this is a very important um, approach is to adopt and adapt existing standards. Uh, we will have a, we've, again, uh, similar to the previous one, we've allocated a full work, workshop to that in the consultation process. Uh, we uh, will not be creating new standards. Uh, in fact, we will be just looking for existing protocols and um, standards that are out there, we may, uh, you know, at the end of a three year period, be able to register our profile of those standards to say, well, these are the bits of all those standards that uh, apply to us, but um, we will be trying very hard to uh, adopt and adapt. Wonderful. So another follow up question, how will health consumers and research participants interests be addressed and protected in Hassanda? Um, obviously nothing can work here unless we get the, you know, the actual participants on board and in fact uh, look at what value this asset can provide to the participants themselves uh, and to make sure that they're comfortable with the way in which it's being built, delivered, uh, that access is being um, granted to the asset, all those things uh, require the uh, input and the ownership of uh, by through the participants. Um, I did note that, in fact, we have a whole stream of the Hassanda, that, that third yellow stream that I talked about, and we will be doing some active stakeholder management with the um, patient groups and the trial participants. Thanks, Adrian. I'll address the next question to the entire panel. How could Hassanda support interinstitutional research and projects? 
Uh, Julian, do you want to talk to that first and then I'll say something? Uh, I think the, um, you know, the, the, there's an issue in the way that um, data is made available. Um, so I guess it depends on whether you're talking about the primary research or research on the data once collected. Certainly, I think the vision of this is to support um, better, more efficient um, and increased access to data so that um, uh, large collaborative groups or others can access those um, no matter which institution they're in. Um, you know, it's a globally kind of fragmented um, uh, clinical trial data sharing world that we live in with many different repositories, many of which are um, located on individual um, institutions. So part of Hassanda and I think similar initiatives around the world is trying to break out of those individual institutional containers and enable people to work much more easily across institution. Yeah, I agree. And uh, I think it's, I mean, the, uh, what this will bring that, 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 that is wasted currently, uh, as again, again, trial registries, you can find that internationally if people register their trial, most people do now. Um, the, the, day, the, the information about what trials existed there, um, but so much of the data, uh, I would say 95%, I've done a lot of individual patient data meta-analysis collaborations and I'd say 95% of the ones I've been involved with have tons of data that, that they collected, but were not, are not shared, they're not in the publication. You, can't, you don't know they're there until you um, collaborate. So I think, um, as Adrian said, just trying, as, as Julian said, I think trying to, to speed up this whole process is, is what, we're, uh, what we're hoping this will do. So I think, it, it, you know, it's going to enhance what we already do with the registry, but in a much more um, timely and structured and curated fashion. Thanks, Lisa and Julian. Um, so I'll open another question to the panel. Could Hassanda support the provision of real-time health data to assist with timely reporting and emergency responses? Um, and the example here is, is COVID reporting. Uh, I think Adrian might talk to it, but I think the focus here is really on research data rather than um, data that has been collected um, through routine care practice in health systems. But as the point I made earlier, I think we have to think about how we can bring different data sets together. So Hassanda would enhance the ability to combine those research data sets with the data that's being generated through routine practices in health systems. Adrian, do you have anything to add to that response? Uh, no, yeah, the, the focus is obviously not on hospital admissions and you know, as a general you know, big data prospect and not of this um, uh, project. Uh, ARDC has other areas where we're collaborating in that area. But, uh, um, but as Julian said, um, uh, you know, they've been able to update guidelines you know, uh, on a very rapid basis. Um, and there's no, at the moment, it's difficult to link in, you know, to those uh, administrative data sets from uh, clinical trials and, and uh, other out, output data because they're not terribly well managed and you can't, um, you can't do that. So that's exactly the, um, I think we can contribute into that area. I think the culture uh, stream that you talked about, Adrian, the, the fact that that underpins that, a discussion about data sharing uh, in specifically with regards to research data here, but you know, it, it's, it's that culture of uh, trust and sharing of data in a secure, uh, useful way that um, I think um, this whole initiative will also um, raise those discussions nat nationally. And just to add in, you know, uh, working with the IHW, we're hoping to adopt and adapt some of the nationally, the uh, information standards that are used in these national data sets anyway, uh, and which will allow again, as Julian said, this sort of integration into uh, aggregated pools in a much quicker way. Thanks for that response, everyone. Um, it actually is a great um, lead into the next question, which I think you've, you've essentially answered there. 
Is there potential for alignment between Hisanda and the ABS National Health Survey or other health service government data, such as data linkage? And I, and I think you've um, provided a very sound response there. Do you have any further comments around the ABS National Health Survey specifically that you'd like to note? Or should we move on to the next question? Nothing for me. All right, so the next question's for Lisa. How would trials protocols be impacted if the data will be available for sharing afterwards? How would the trials be if it was available? Okay, so one of the, the most key, I mean, the most, the key thing is also is consent, um, is to make sure within the protocol um, that people are aware that their data will, um, may be used um, secondarily uh, afterwards, de-identified, proper governance, et cetera, et cetera, not a, not, not a um, free-for-all model. Um, so I think uh, trialists need, now need to be making sure that they write, you know, have that somewhere in their, their protocol. Uh, and it's becoming more common and it's, uh, and if we're to, to, to get to a world that Julian's wanting us to be at, you know, living real time, uh, accumulating data as it, as it's, as it happens, we, we can't be spending, what I usually do is, you know, spend a year trying to get everything reconsented and data sharing agreements and all sorts of other things that be, mainly because in the past we haven't asked for, um, or specified within the, the trial protocol that, um, there would be a reasonable reuse of, of data to answer the same or similar questions that the original participants uh, consented to that trial for. We think it's a really important part of the initiative and we will be allocating resources to um, consensus and common um, and templates, et cetera, around consent that, that you know, the Hasanda participants can all, um, you know, contribute to and then uh, you start to use uh, as part of that coherence and coordination that we're trying to, broader coherence and coordination that we're trying to promote through the Hacenda initiative. In terms of that broader coherence and coordination, what sort of incentives and barriers will Hacenda address for organisations in sharing their data? Yes. Um, the key things that can be done in the, within the infrastructure, I'll start within the infrastructure and kind of move out, is the um, acknowledgement uh, and you know, having that you know, really key in the, the, the use of the data referred and referenced. Uh, the fact that it exists as a data asset means it can be uh, referenced you know, clearly and publishers can see it and it can be part of the, the profile and output of the researcher themselves. Um, so I think that that's probably the key one is to get that reward and incentive system there. So I think the infrastructure can allow it to be referenced. There are a number of uh, culture and policy things to do with rewards when you're applying for uh, grants, uh, rewards when you're in the um, institutional systems. Uh, but I think they, were, they rely on the evidence, you know, did this data get used? Uh, and I think the actual the system can actually help that to say, well, the, you know, here it was downloaded by this project and we got a report from them. So we can build that into the infrastructure to say, you know, how has it been used? I think that will be the key incentive in the long run for organisations and researchers to say, well, look, we can get um, acknowledgement. I think there is a little bit of tinkering in the scholarly system, you know, to um, readjust from the sort of obsession with journal articles uh, and balance that with other, um, other you know, data reuse uh, incentives. Thanks for that, Adrian. Uh, unfortunately, um, we're out of time for Q&A, so that will be our last question for now. I just want to thank all our panel members for their responses. We will collate um, all questions from today's session and also invite participants to provide written submissions through the Survey Monkey form. And of course, the breakout sessions will provide opportunities to consider more specific use cases. Uh, before we head into the breakout room, so I've been asked to give a really brief overview, given that we're running a little bit over time, um, of AHW's data development process, which is informing the consultation approach for Hassanda. Um, so what I'll do is I'll um, take control of the screen sharing 
and um, do a quick overview of that. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can. Wonderful, thank you. So first we'll just have a quick look at AHW and our role in Hasanda and consider the best practice um, data development, which will help guide the discussions in the breakouts rooms, which we'll be moving to shortly. AHW is an independent statutory authority. We were established to develop, collect and produce health and welfare related information and statistics. Our products contribute to health promotion in Australia. The metadata and Meteor unit within AHW supports our metadata capability. Metadata includes all the contextual information required to understand data, for example, the data definitions and code sets. And um, you would have gathered from Lisa and Julian's presentations earlier that metadata is extremely important, for example, for systematic reviews and the like. So our expertise is in developing national data standards to harmonise collection and reporting across Australia. The benefits of national data standards include accessibility, consistency and comparability for data use and reuse. AHW uses an authoritative expert body called the National Health Data and Information Standards Committee to endorse health data standards for use across Australia. The process of um, building a data set like the Health Studies um, Australian National Data Asset is described as data development. So AHW uses our expertise to assist other projects and organisations like ARDC to undertake their data development activities. We use established principles and processes which are outlined in AHW's guide to data development in order to produce high quality data that meets user needs and builds consensus on the content and the quality of the data requirements. Data development is a methodological process, which is informed by a set of guiding principles um, outlined on this slide. Um, for the purposes of today's workshop, we'll just emphasize two of these principles. Um, principle three um, is about being clear about the purpose of the data collection. This primarily involves considering what questions you're trying to answer with the data collection and what information is required to achieve that. So these considerations will directly impact your data needs and development. We'll also look at principle seven, um, data development may be incremental. So there may be some information that can be readily defined and captured and other data that's more difficult to quantify or reach agreement on. It doesn't have to be achieved in one go and can be an incremental process. So the early focus on clinical trials demonstrates this approach for Hasanda. It's a relatively well-defined space to start and application can be extended over time to keep, um, keep providing value. So the principles um, that we just covered underpin the steps we follow through the data development process. We'll be looking at the foundations for data development today and build on these outcomes in future workshops. So that, that's um, an ex a good example of the incremental process. So the foundation for data development is understanding what information we're trying to gain from the data and why. Um, and key questions to consider in this is building um, the purpose and the benefits. So this embodies the principle of also being clear about the purpose of the data set and can be informed by generating value statements. So generally Hasena aims to provide access to the outputs of health studies, facilitating the reuse of data in research communities for improved outcomes. How Hasena should provide value for you will be explored further in the breakouts. Um, so we'll look beyond the operationalizing technology and explore capabilities and use cases that Hasanda aims to support and consider the identified value streams while also addressing any gaps. Um, so, so commenting on how these could be enhanced through the Hasanda program. So we'll be looking at the user stories and value propositions that will inform later stages of the development process. Um, and I think I'd like to invite you all now to, um, to join your assigned breakout room since we're running um, quite a bit behind time there. So.